Today we're going to talk a little bit about placement stabilizer. And so I kind of put a top 10 list. I, I kind of brought this down to 10 lists. There's, there's really 10 myths in some situations you can look at, uh, 10 questions on stabilizers and placement. And we're going to hopefully go through these 10 today and just kind of shed a light on um, is it real, is it not real, should I be concerned, should I not be concerned about some of these things. And if there is a concern, are there ways that we can minimize that risk and um, maximize that potential. So uh, there, there continues to be a debate, is placement more important than timing? And it really depends who, um, um, so placement is not as important as timing. And number two, placement is more important than timing. And so I think the two really have to go hand in hand. Um, you know, I think today placement is, is the chapter of the book that 360 has spent the most time on. If you look at a book of, if, if we opened a book and it was 10 chapters and it was all about nitrogen management, there's some chapters of that book that we've identified that we need to start writing. There's other parts of that book that that chapter is almost done. And placement is really one of those things. We have a really good idea on timing as well. But timing without placement is an inefficient approach. So we're going to talk a lot about placement today. Number three is nitrogen is mobile. And I have had, a, uh, I've had good results with Coulter and posterior applications. And I would say that that statement is very true. I can speak. I can speak in terms of um, my last 20 years in this business. I've been blessed to be in ag retail for many, many of those years, and I saw a lot of Coulter applications. I saw a lot of good ones, and I saw a lot of bad ones. And I and I there's a risk associated with placing nitrogen that far away from the plant. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that risk is and how efficient that is. And we've had good luck at times with with posturea, actually. Um, posteria has shown some really good results, but is it the most efficient way? So when a farmer um, comes up to, 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 you know, when a grower or something comes up to me and says, I've had good results, uh, I absolutely believe that he has. Um, but it's kind of the progression of looking at these things. And we're going to talk about placement a little bit more here in just a second. Um, number four, if I lay UAN on top of the ground, I will lose it all. Um, there's just a, a a misunderstanding or a lack of trust in stabilizers. And I think that really stems to the fact that there's so many offerings out there and some work and some don't. So it's just like everything else. Sometimes um, you remember that one stabilizer, what, you know, when you dug into it, it wasn't what it was thought to be. And so all stabilizers get put in that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, number five, if there's no rain in the seven day, even a stabilizer, I can't apply it or I will lose it. And we're going to kind of talk about that because we're in a we're in a time frame right now. Um, you know, for a lot of uh, at least the Midwest here, um, we're not getting rain events right now. So nitrogen is a major nutrient. It's, it's plentiful in the soil. We see all these bullets. We see these huge million gallon UAN solution tanks. And we just think that nitrogen is, you know, there's just so much of it that, um, you know, it's, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, all my nitrogen in UAN is susceptible of loss without rain. And we're going to talk about what part is susceptible and what part is not. Um, if I add ATS, ammonium thiosulfate, to my UAN, it acts as a stabilizer. I don't need, a, need an agritain product or a lemus or your recent type inhibitor. Um, and what we've seen with that is the fact is that it can regulate the pH around it to some degree, but it would take so much of it that uh, it's just not, it, it, you know, it's just not going to do what we want it to do. So an ATS um, is not a substitute for a long-acting stabilizer. Um, number nine is, I read an article, my corn is, is V2, it said I don't need to worry about nitrogen, you have time. And I think we have to worry about some of these articles. You may have yellow corn, and it may be yellow for a variety of reasons, and it may not be nitrogen. And so knowing what that is and what that is not, um, I think we always have to think about nitrogen. And not because our corn plants look a certain color at V2, just because we have to understand what our fields have been through since our applications and what our applications were. And number 10, uh, the additional time it takes to wide drop over posterior, I just don't see a big enough difference. 
And so those are some of the things that I hope we answer today in the next 20 minutes. Um, preparing a nitrogen plan is specific to you. There's so many generalities out there that say you don't need to apply nitrogen or you know, it's, it's, it's a very holistically large view. But no two people's planters are, are usually set up the same. No farmer farms exactly the same as his neighbor. And so we got to start really understanding how the nitrogen plan is for you. Um, we have to get away from the generalizations, the assumptions um, um, with nitrogen. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. So this next slide is over the last 20 years of my career, I've been a part of all of these things. Um, I remember early on um, when we started using NSERV, it was all, we, I was in an area where it was all fall, it was all once and done. And so we tested strips as to whether NSERV was a good solution to maintain nitrogen versus not. And what we saw is some years it helped and some years it didn't. And we looked at those stabilizers as being a yield enhancer. And really what we should have done that looked at those as a nitrogen protector. So we've, we've worked with some fall applications on different things. We've looked at planter attachments and we've started, you know, we've continued to progress from just a, just laying the nitrogen right, you know, by the seed or, and then we went um, two by two. And now in a lot of cases it's two by two by two. So we just continue to look at placement. Um, you know, Coulter, middle of the row, um, was, uh, you know, was thought to be put there, so we're not clipping roots, we're putting it in the middle of the row. Um, Posteria, obviously the picture there, and then you see Y drop coming down through the row, and there's just a lot of different options out there today. And the thing that we wanna be sure, certain when we talk about placement is it's just a progression. Uh, we continue to learn more, we continue to learn more, our hybrids have changed it, root systems have changed a little bit, uh, a lot of things have changed. So when you look at this, this is actually a picture of Matt Foes up in Illinois here just this past week. Um, he runs a, a unreferred coulter or, a, or un, unreferred side dress, um, which was uh, really designed for coulter. Matt switched that thing over to Y drop. And so we're just continuing to look about placement. The thing that really sh looks to me in this picture is Matt has a lot of residue. And you can see his row cleaners did a, did a wonderful job. And the nice thing what he's doing today is he's taking a product of the next generation of technology and he's laying nitrogen right in the highway that he cleaned out with his row cleaners. Now, yeah, some of that residue has moved a little bit back in, but for the most part, that is where it wants to be. I think about a coulter running down through that and all the work it has to do to cut through all that residue. And, and how efficient is that? And so we're gonna look at that here in just a few minutes as well again. So when we look at roots, this is, these are some pictures that you've all seen. Um, Matt Foes, uh, we use a lot of his uh, flower pot analogy kind of there in the center and the lower. Uh, we look at what Fred Bilo brings to us, just at a 32,000 population. Um, the top is a Winfield box. And we just continue to start to look at what is underground and how are we going to get farmer applied nitrogen, nitrogen um, and nutrients into the plant? And so when we start looking underground, it's really, it's really important for us to say, okay, these are where my root systems are. And this next picture, um, it gets a little busy with the paint, but I was hoping to bring it out. So this next picture, um, we went out earlier this week and we dug a pit about five feet deep, six feet deep. And we sit there for about an hour and a half and we carve these root systems out. And we wanted it to portray very honestly to you what these look like. Um, we are not here to, we just wanted it to, to be what it, we wanted it to be. And you'll see the root systems coming under the heart root systems between the two red marks. And you'll also see roots in the center. Um, we, you know, we follow those roots back and roots will find a channel and they will grow different places. But the question we, we when we step back is where is the majority of the uptake? Um, we at 360 never say they all the roots grow right underneath the plant. What we do say is the vast majority of the uptake and close to 85% of the roots is about four inches on each side of the stalk and right down. And I'll show you some information that we that we validated that through markers in 
in, uh, in farmer applied nitrogen. But this is really what it looks like under the ground. So when you're going in and you're applying nitrogen, and your hope would be that for every pound that you apply, you get as many of them in the plant that you possibly can. It's just trying to understand where those root systems are and how we can place them. So the biggest thing is as we look at each one of those roots, there is a there is a, a lot of things that go on with them. So for, from a planter setup, we work really, really hard on planters to be able to make that a very, very positive path, a very important path, because we're setting the stage for the ability for a plant to navigate down through the soil to be able to bring up what it needs to produce that weight in that ear. So each one of those root systems is going to uptake about 18 to 21 gallons of water. And it's simply doing the math of understanding how much water it takes per acre, breaking it down by plant population. And for the most part, I use around 34,000 plants. So the question is, is how much nitrogen do these plants uptake? And how do they uptake it? So we're going to look into that a little bit. But the first thing I think we really need to understand is what are we applying? So if, if, if we're going out in the field, we've got something in that sprayer, we've got something in that tank. And so for the most part, we're using some type of a UAN product. It may have other nutrients in it besides just nitrogen. But for the most part, when we look at UAN and we look at the nitrogen sources in UAN, you're going to be about 50% urea, which is what we need to make sure that we protect. It's going to be about 25% ammonium, and it's going to be about 25% nitrate. So if you're putting down, say, 60 pounds, you're going to be susceptible to loss of the urea part of that. I think in some situations when we make those applications, we make there's an assumption out there that we are completely um, um, we can are completely at the sake of potential complete loss. Uh, that nitrate, that ammonium is going to hang out there. It's going to just sit there until we get pushed in. Urea. Um, is the one that we need to protect or we need to understand when that next rain event is. If there is not, then we have options to be able to protect that. And we're going to get through that a little bit more. So as now we have that in the tank, and now we're going to go out and we're going to lay that out, and we may or may not have a stabilizer with it. It, it just depends on, on, on your risk load, the, the forecast, and different things. So now we're coming out and we're going to apply. And so there's a couple, but this, is, this next section here is really going to talk about what is the true volume that I am applying. Now, I said if you can look there at those, those stocks that I cut off so we can see better where the nitrogen goes, if each one of those root systems underneath there is going to uptake roughly 18 to 21 gallons of water in a growing season. And so we're out here and we're making the assumption that we are coming in and we are side dressing 60 pounds of actual N. So, um, you know, 60, you know, we're looking at, I'm not sure exactly that you divide that out, but as far as gallons, but lots of times we think that that's a lot. But when we start looking at per plant of what we're doing and farmer applied nutrients getting in the plant, each and every plant is going to get about two cc's. So if you take a syringe, I'm an old hog farmer guy, take a syringe and two cc's and uh, ran a lot of syringes in my time, that is the amount of nitrogen that we are applying to the plant. And you'll see there that we're, that I've, uh, I've, I've kind of displayed there, applying it on both sides of the plant. And so when we start thinking about getting it in the plant and getting it efficiently in the plant at, them, at those volumes, it's really pretty crazy. If we were going to go out and apply 170 pounds of nitrogen, and that was of UAN, it would be about six ounces per plant. Um, is what we're looking at as, as far as a volume. So what does that look like when we put it in the center of the row? And so you'll see here um, kind of detecting what where the placement would be if we had a coulter. And you can start feeling what that inefficiency would be. Okay, we're applying it a long ways away. We're applying it in the center of the row. Um, as you saw in Matt's picture, in some cases there's a lot of residue in the middle of the row. Uh, which that part of that nitrogen can get tied up into that residue. And so we're just looking at what is the most efficient way that we can. So those are two ways. So 
The next way is post urea. And so this is a, this is again, this is, you can kind of see my marks in there. I, I did it on the same spot. So you've got my Y drop over there. You've got the coulter. And so if you're applying urea to a plant, I weighed it out. You're going to, each plant is going to get about 1.73 grams or about 230 pearls. And so I put about 700 pearls in a cup and tried to resonate. Now, I don't know, it doesn't look like 700 pearls, but there's about 700 pearls there. And tried to scheme what it would look like coming out of the back of the spreader. And so I just wanted you to visualize what that's going to look like. All these applications were um, going in and side dressing roughly about 60 pounds. So what have we done <clears throat> besides just taking things to yield? And um, this was some good information that we got back from um, the University of Illinois. Uh, there's a professor there, Mulvaney, that has, has, has been able to tackle into some technology called Nuclear N. And basically what this has done is, um, what this has done is it, it, it can take nitrogen that is applied, the, what I call it is farmer applied nitrogen, and we can detect how much of it actually gets into the plant. And so when we look at the top line there, we got Y drop. We did three different things. In 2017, our plan is also to do urea. <clears throat> We're going to expand this a little bit more. Um, I would tell you that we had a pretty heavy foundation on this. Um, I hope this year is that we can lighten up more of a more of a, a little bit less of a base to be able to, I think we'll actually see this be a greater difference in 2017. But Y drop was the best. When we did a single hose on one side of the plant, there was 11% less uptake. Um, you can call it loss, you can call it whatever you want, but it did not get detected in the plant. It did not make it into the plant. When we looked at the coulter in the center of the row, 25% less of the farmer applied nitrogen made it in the plant. And so this is kind of what it looks like in a pitcher. <clears throat> When they do these things, they grind up these plants, they look at what's in the plant, they look at what's in the ear. Um, we are going to look next year as far as what is still in the root system. And so as we look at, not only have we seen a four to eight bushel increase just in placement, um, that's not variable rating, that's not timing, that's just strictly placement. I was gonna do this this day, but now I'm doing this we see a four to eight bushel and we believe that we can build on that as far as yield and we start bringing in timing and start writing more chapters of the book. So if you know me and my presentations, you're never going to get through one without a board test. And so this is just the infield. So you saw what Dr. Mulvaney did. Um, you saw my pictures of what volume that is. And so we'll come back to this here quick. But this is a board test, and so you'll see here on the left, this, this field had 140 pounds of fall anhydrous. It was followed by um, an in-season coulter application on the front of a, a hagging machine at B9. So this corn was probably getting fairly close to waist tall when this application was made. And I came back after the corn had just got done and finished pollinating, and I wanted to see how much of that nitrogen was still left in the center of that row. And so what you'll see in that graph there is I came in, I did 0 to 12, 12 to 24, and you can see the spike of all that nitrogen that was farmer applied is still sitting in the center of the row after we had all those, all those days of rapid uptake. And so this is a picture back through it. So I went out and you can see the pollen through there. You can see there's potassium, a little bit of potassium deficiency. There's also some nitrogen deficiency. You can see actually where the coulter ran. And what we saw is the fact that we just were not able to move that into the root system. It was put 15, 15 inches away, and it just wasn't able to get there. And so we're going to talk a little bit about stem water here in a little bit, and it's, and it's going to come to the point where once we shade that row, we get very little um, rain to the center of that row to be able to push that nitrogen anywhere. The majority of it is funneled down to the plant. Just another look here, um, hopefully this picture pops up. So this is something I did the very first year that I was with 360 because there was been a lot of debate on placement of 
you know, I think I can go every row of the row, which you certainly can. That is that is a very good alternative. Or should I go every row? And and so we were doing our, our due diligence, and I was trying to build my thought process because I was curious. And so what we're seeing is in those placement situations where we truly need nitrogen, and that's typically the parts of the field that are very tight because root mass is very small, and it's just not a real healthy environment, or lighter soils where we just can't hold nitrogen. Now, the very plush soils that are very generous as far as giving back nitrogen, um, we did not see much difference one side versus both, but where we had heavy soils and where we had light soils, we could actually dig up the plant and see a stimulation on which side of the plant got the nitrogen. Now, you'll see the ears on the right, and this is an air part of the field that, that we were needing nitrogen, and we saw a significant yield increase of applying to both sides. Now, if you walk out into a field with a farmer, um, just like everything else, there's certain parts of your field that are going to reward you more without attention to detail, and some are not going to reward you as much. But uh, just looking at that placement and that application and different things like that. So the one thing I wanted to bring up a little bit, and it kind of alludes back to that picture of all that nitrogen in the middle of the row, this stem water thing is bigger than I think anybody thought. Um, it's bigger than I thought. I walked corn for 15 years, and didn't give it near the credit that I thought it would give. Um, we get a rain event, my corn looks better, all is happy. I get a big enough rain event, it's muddy all the way through. I get a small rain event, I'm still kicking dust up in the center. And so when you look at this, um, as far as placement, you know, once we get it in the ground or on the ground, we need to get it to the plant. And just another thing from a placement standpoint that builds on the fact that it's close to the root system is we're seeing about a three to four X amount of water dropped at the base because of the funneling effect versus in the center of the row. And so this is something that I did, and as far as collecting it, um, and just being able to collect that water, this is after three tenths of rain. Um, we had about 24 uh, ounces of water come down the plant. Um, we had about seven to eight ounces of water that dropped in the middle. And when we did our rain gauge out on the, that had no um, deflection, we had about 16 ounces. So 16 ounces is what dropped. Uh, the corn funneled 24 of those 16 to the base of the plant, and only about seven fell in the middle. And so it's just the culmination of trying to drive this in, and where is the water coming that's going to incorporate that into the, uh, the ground. And this is just another picture here. You can see I was able to put my probe right down the root system after just a couple tenths of rain, and, and you get four, you know, three, four, five, six inches off. And um, instead of being able to stick my probe in, I was having a challenging time just drilling it. So uh, just that funnel effect of that water is, is pretty important. So the one thing I want to hit on here, just a few more slides here, and I want to talk a little bit about stabilizers. And so when you make a UAN application, when you make a UAN application, it's, it's not all susceptible. It's 25% nitrate, it's 25% ammonium, and it's 50% urea. Um, and so the question is, is how susceptible is that, is that? And it's the half of urea that is the one that we are concerned with, with as far as volatilization. And so I just wanted to put up this slide and there's many stabilizers out there. The ones I'm most familiar with, because they're the ones I've used, I know they work, I've seen them work, um, is, uh, is Agritain. And for the most part, this is a urease inhibitor. And I believe this chart to be true, because I've seen it. So the biggest thing is, is when you lay urea out there, whether it be urea or the urea part of UAN, um, you need to neutralize that pH around that pearl or, or around that UAN. And what you need to do is you need to slow that urease enzyme from coming and attacking that urea. And so that's really what agartane does. And you'll see, so a lot of people will say, well, it's dry right now. I don't think I should go out. I don't think I should even go out with stabilizers. What we've seen with, with a product like these urease inhibitors um, that we know for sure work and do the things that we want them to do they will stabilize that and protect that urea for a pretty long period of time. 
now, especially um, you know you, when you get really really hot, different things. Of course, those things can speed up that. Maybe it's only a 14 day residual um, versus more favorable conditions that might be a 21 or better. But those products work. So if you're going out on a day like today and you're applying Y drop and you're not sure when the next rain event will be and you want to protect yourself from loss, products like Agritain or Lemus do a, do a wonderful, wonderful job. And so one thing that you want to be very careful of is I was with a grower the other day and he was using Instinct, a uh, Dow product, uh, kind of a similar product to Enser but for, for UAN. And Instinct is a wonderful product, uh, works well. Instinct is not a urease inhibitor. Instinct is a product that wants the, um, it basically does very similar to what NSERV does. It keeps ammonium in the ammonium form longer. So we do have some growers that run a product like Agritain with Instinct if they want double the protection. For the most part, growers are just running Agritain. So, Stabilizers do exactly what they're doing. This chart here, um, I believe with all my heart because I've seen it. And so um, if we need a fact, if that's a concern, um, and in some cases it should be a concern, we do have a solution for that. So just a little bit of a, a break-even investment here. Um, uh, the placement book of, of our nitrogen book it has a lot of pages to it, and we've written them well, and we've validated them well. And quite honestly, we're going to start working more on the other pages, the other chapters of this nitrogen book. But we continually see four to five to six to eight to 10 to 12 bushels. Again, 12 would probably be, you know, kind of the extreme of five and a half to eight is really common of an increase just by placement. And so the chart below just kind of talks about, you know, if, if, if you're typically doing something with a coulter bar, or potentially even post urea, you know what is the what is the benefit of up um, of upping yourself to that next level of technology with placement? And so on a 12 row uh, 12 row system, 250 acres, you've got it, and you can just see the math as we move through there. This is based on a five and a half bushel advantage, um, a 360 corn market is when is when we made this chart. So as we wrap up. Um, as I talk about the chapters in the book, um, we've seen it time and time again where that placement um, of that low volume nitrogen, and we don't often say low volume nitrogen, we think of major nutrients, but it's really a low volume. So a combination of farmer applied nitrogen and soil given nitrogen, if we can just get that more consistently in the root system, this is really what the next chapter is going to be is how can we apply less and get more? or how can we apply more and get more? And so this is just one chart that we use a lot as we go through the system. So just in a, in a closing, um, the planter components that, that, that we're using on the market today, the harvest equipment has all evolved over time because we've learned more. Technology has advanced, and we're seeing that same thing with y -Drop. We have products, we have stabilizers on the market, if that's something that we need, um, to help enhance that application if we are afraid of loss. Um, placement is very, very important. Thank you and have a great day.